intellectual. Uh, we're trying to think about responsibility beyond direct perpetrator victim relationships. No? So for, for Mandane, in recent work, we are all survivors, yeah? Whether victim or perpetrator, there is something about surviving. And he does this, I think, in an important way because um, he says that Western understandings of post conflict reconstruction are rooted in Nuremberg and rooted in the experience of the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is a very particular occurrence where either the majority were exterminated or they left and created a new country. So victim and perpetrator didn't have to live together. But for most other conflicts, people have to live together. They have to interact, as you would have seen when you crossed that border yesterday and you see the interaction between two communities divided by a wall. No? In Rwanda, in South Sudan, in Sierra Leone, victim and perpetrators are often uh, living together. So the question then was about reflecting on how does that happen? How, does that, how do people come together after that? Um, so his discussion around survivors, I think, was about saying that, you know, whether you did this or you were a victim, we're all surviving in this terrible misery and how do we overcome that? Um, other people were trying to capture the fact that the relationship between victim and perpetrator is insufficient to reflect those people that are involved in processes. Yeah? And then so the language of bystander, uh, those that saw but did nothing, um, and allies, uh, those that did see but tried to intervene. You know, so there is a whole range of vocabularies, I think, that circulates around that. And um, I think that uh, Michael Rothberg tried then to talk about the implicated subject as being um, a way of thinking about those people, those actors that are involved in acts of human rights violation that are not architects of that violence sometimes are not even conscious of that violence but that violence couldn't have taken place without their active participation so he gives the example in the book of the train controller uh, who facilitated the transport of Jews gypsies, communists, uh, disabled. gays, disabled, that were transported uh, um, in uh, trains uh, to the death camps and said that although that controller didn't, might not have known that he was doing that, the Holocaust couldn't have happened in that way without his participation. No? And once you open up that, it starts to make you reflect on your own implicated nature of your relationships to a, a range of, of events. So I guess that's the kind of idea. Now, I think that an important part of this, an important part of my talk on this, is that um, I think when you talk about white privilege or white fragility, um, it induces a level of guilt amongst white people. I'm, I feel sorry, I'm, I'm a white person, um, and I'm responsible for this. Um, and that guilt can sometimes lead to a kind of paralysis, yeah? Maybe a stepping out to say, okay, I'm not welcome here, I shouldn't be here. Um, Rothberg's argument was that he didn't want to induce guilt, he wanted to do, induce responsibility. And he wanted to induce responsibility because he wanted to support action. He wanted people to say, yes, I am part of that, and I'm going to work with other people to try to transform it, to try to change it. Yeah? So I think the implicated subject implies an activity to be involved in those processes, to try to take responsibility for your implication in these acts. And, um, you know, it's difficult, it, it's different from the legal 
response. He's not arguing that the implicated subject is legally responsible, yeah? It's not a legal issue. You can't take people to court for being implicated. Um, it's a social responsibility, a moral responsibility, to recognise that we might be involved in these processes. Um, and he talked about a range of different ways that you could think about this. Uh, um, and uh, two of the kind of dimensions was this kind of diachronic and synchronic. And the kind of diachronic was the kind of accumulated histories of implication that lead to privilege or oppression and vice versa. So kind of legacies of colonialism and slavery and racism, think about those and how they, um, the past hangs heavy in the present. And then the synchronic was about in the present, the way a range of actors might be implicated more broadly in atrocities, yeah? Um, so I guess that from having read that and uh, I think there's a range of um, people that have been, been inspired by the framework of Michael Rothberg and have gone off in different disciplines so we've been talking about kind of bringing together different disciplines to, to reflect on this because I think it's a, it's a useful concept um, I decided then to think a little bit about our own field and to try to work out my own implication, no? Because I've been, as I was saying, more or less around this field for more than two decades and wanted to, uh, to reflect a little bit about that. Um, then how do you talk about academic disciplines in relation to this? Well, that's interesting. No, we, yesterday we had these really good discussions around methodology and how do you analyse your data and we have this idea that academic subjects develop through discussions around excellence and what is the best method or what is the best methodology to answer this question as if the only thing that's important is the intellectual project. No? But then we know that intellectual projects are situated in a broader political economy of research where some things are seen as valid for studying, some countries, some places, some subjects, and others seem unimportant. Um, but we rarely analyse fields in relation to that political economy. So this is a quote from Roger Dale, which he gave in his presidential speech to the British Association of International and Comparative Education back in 2015, where he said, the starting point is that the complexity and significance of the relationship between fields of study as distinct and collective academic endeavors with that which they seek to explore, comment on, understand and explain are relatively rarely addressed. Exponents of such fields often seem to proceed on the assumption that they are purely driven by the sets of methods, theories, concepts, approaches and so on that have been developed in the name of comparative education, for example. And in that, he asks for us to all look and reflect on the conditions of production of knowledge in our field. Yeah? So what is that broader political economy that shapes what is valid and what is not valid, what methods we should use and what we shouldn't. Um, and in a sense, I tried then um, to reflect that and to think about, well, let's tell the story of education and emergencies through this kind of critical political economy lens. And, and, and what do we get then? Um, so, the field of education in emergencies really emerges out of refugee education. It emerges after the Second World War, where refuge, in refugee camps, which were normally at the borders of countries that were in conflict, um, at the emergence of the United Nations and the UNHCR, um, and largely people that were working in what is now known as education in emergencies that didn't exist then were largely working on refugee education. 
it wasn't really until the mid 1990s that people started to articulate a broader field and I think that one of the major catalysts for the emergence of this field was the discovery that over half of the out-of-school kids in the world were living in conflict-affected contexts. This was in the background to 1990 John Tien, Education for All, a major milestone in our field where international community, international organisations came together and set a range of targets that were eventually eroded, narrowed down to universal primary education and gender equity. But nevertheless, um, those targets were set to try to address issues of uh, access to schooling and gender equality. Halfway through the, uh, the targets, there was a recognition in the follow-up that, uh, as normal, um, we hadn't got as far as we'd hoped. And in the run-up to that, there was a recognition that half of those kids were out, in, out, of, uh, out of school, were in conflict-affected context. This was when INEE, that Camilla talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. the Interagency Network in Education Emergencies, was born. It was born in the run-up to Dakar. There were other organisations important that were born too. Global Campaign for Education, Civil Society's role in education also emerged there. But if we stick to the conflict area, that was where. So, in a sense, it was the international com community had suddenly said, conflict and education matter, and we need to understand why it is in conflicts there is um, so many kids out of school. And now it's pretty obvious why there are lots of kids out of school, no? But it channeled some resources, it channeled some interest, and people started to inquire around that, no? Initially, it started with questions around, you know, why? And people said, well, education is a victim of conflict. No, in wars, schools are bombed, teachers are displaced, students are displaced, so inevitably that. But as that moved on, questions were saying, well, is education always a victim or is it part of the problem? So we started to ask questions around the ways that schooling could generate conflict through social exclusion, through... Uh, um, use of uh, other people's languages, uh, imposition, alienation, the whole range of ways that education... So we started then to talk about this two faces of education, that education could both promote peace but also promote war, and how would we address that? So a whole range of tools and uh, techniques about how to practically manage, some of which Camilla was talking about yesterday, also merged during that period. Um, a second major change from outside again was um, the post-Cold War period. The post-Cold War period was important because um, up until then, everything was happening uh, in this field was in refugee camps on the borders of countries. But after the Cold War, suddenly, these things were happening inside. Why was that? What changed? Why was it that before then we talked about refugees, but after then we talked about IDPs? Why, why is there no literature on IDPs before 1990? The reason was because during the Cold War, the, UN, the United Nations was paralysed. It was paralysed with vetoes, vetoes that today we see in practice in Palestine, where the, the Security Council prevents action. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, for a period of time, the United Nations was somewhat set free. And as a result, it started intervening not in the borders, but in the internal affairs of member states, which actually in the foundations of the United Nations, uh, there was an argument that all states are internally sovereign and we shouldn't interfere. But there was an argument that if a state was not fulfilling its obligations to its population, then the international community had a right to humanitarian intervention 
in the internal affairs of those countries. Now, we all know how that story went, yeah? Some countries we intervened in, other countries we choose to turn a blind eye. But nevertheless, the point is, is that suddenly people like yourselves, who were previously working on the borders of the country in refugee camps, suddenly were entering inside countries. Because with the international peacekeepers came the international humanitarian activities. And that's why IDPs were tracked for the first time from that period. Uh, before we didn't count IDPs um, and that's why suddenly from that period you see the death of aid workers increasing in numbers because suddenly they were in much more difficult situations yeah they weren't anymore at the borders but actually right in the middle no and again Gaza is an extreme example of the amount of aid workers that have been killed in a short pound historically unprecedented yeah so so that was a shift the third shift which so think about that shift, what it meant was that we weren't, weren't talking about refugee education, we were talking about how to deliver education in the midst of war. Should we deliver education for? Is education life-saving, as Camilla was talking about yesterday? Should it be part of that humanitarian cluster, or is it something that we can wait till later? No? So there's a range of discussions around that. Stage three, post 9-11. Post 9-11, in this analysis, becomes important, right? Why post 9-11? Because after the Twin Towers attack, the first accusations was that the people that were in the planes that hit the Twin Towers were radicalized in madrasas either in Pakistan or in the border with Afghanistan and Pakistan. No? And that 30% of Pakistanis were going to radical madrasas that were teaching them to hate the West. The statistics were totally fake. Uh, there was only a small percent of students that were going to, rad uh, to madrasas and even smaller that were going to radical uh, madrasas, but it stuck. And there is something about this period of post 9-11 <laughs> radicalization, uh, war on terror, um, that intersected education very centrally. No? Um, and I can talk a little bit about that uh, when we go on to, uh, to this uh, case. Then we have Afghanistan, another important area. Gender becomes important in that story. Uh, but again, relationships between education uh, expand. Lots of stuff on de-radicalization not just in conflict-affected contexts, but also in the UK and other parts. We have the Prevent Agenda in the UK, where all teachers in UK schools are statutorily responsible for identifying signs of radi radicalization amongst their students. And we have to report that, and we have to get trained as a teacher, as an academic, in this kind of stuff. So the field, has gone from refugees to expanding, expanding to these different things. Uh, um, and the geography has expanded. And then, of course, another stage is uh, Syria and the war in Syria. And again, a big boost for research and practice on refugee education. But not refugee education everywhere in the world, but on the borders of the countries, particularly Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, right? Because what does Europe want? The refugees to stay over there. So we'll provide lots of resources for refugee training and education there and try to block the borders so that the refugees don't enter into Europe now. So you can see from that analysis, and I'm not, I understand it only tells part of that story and that if Camilla was here, she would tell a different story of the evolution of that field but the connections are also there in terms of funding yeah funding does not follow intellectual inquiry it funds political demand and that is the point that we research things yeah you go to a conference and you see there are 30 papers 
out of 50 on refugee education. It's not because suddenly everybody has been caught by an imagination of refugees. It's because refugees has become a designated funding area. Yeah? Why is there hardly any research on higher education outside of northern capitalist states for the last, for previous three decades because we prioritized universal primary education and the focus on basic education and we didn't fund higher education so you could expand this to different areas so basically when we think about the field we need to think about it as a kind of western quite narrow project which needs to be opened up to a critique. It's not just about the children, it's not just about um, technical issues, uh, there are also politics behind it and we need to understand the relationship between the technical intervention and those broader political processes. Um, so going back to Rothberg um, and this kind of implicated subject, then we kind of, we could think about this in the kind of uh, diachronic way, so the long durée. So think about your field and think about its links back into the past. And so, you know, in the paper, uh, probably quite flippantly, I talk about the relationship between the soldier and the missionary during colonialism and talk today about the relationship between the military and the NGOs as kind of two sides of a similar humanitarian... Oh, interventionary uh, um, uh, coin. Um, and uh, Omar Qatari has written some interesting, really interesting stuff around many of the similarities between development and colonialism. And often we kind of think development, good, colonialism, bad. No? Probably at that time we thought colonialism was good, but <laughs> post-colonial, we think of it negatively. We think of it as problematic, but we think of development as, 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 as promising. You know? And basically she makes some very interesting and powerful arguments around the, those continuities. And she says that we need to be wary of histories of development that deny this colonial genealogy an attempt to create distinct and artificial boundaries between the exploitation of empire and the humanitarianism of development. Uh, and then she uses a quote from Cecil Rhodes, uh, Cecil Rhodes being the roads of Rhodes Must Fall and the massive student <laughs> protests in South Africa to try to get rid of the statue of Rhodes outside the University of Cape Town, um, that imperialism was philanthropy plus a 5% dividend on investment, no? So, you know, there was an argument that colonialism was also about helping, yeah? And, you know, if you... And there are some around that still try to defend British colonialism. They'll talk about the, the trains that the British built in India, or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll try to give you some of the positive dimensions. And, you know, not dissimilar, uh, you could talk about that um, in the field of development. Um, so here... Uh, is a reflection a little bit on our own field, yeah? The Institute of Education, some of you maybe even have studied here, I think. Uh, the most important Institute of Education in the world, ranked uh, best uh, uh, education um, school in the world. Um, and this is a little sketch done by two leading academics in the Center for uh, Education and International Development, SEED, uh, Moses Oketch and Elaine Unterhalter, South African and a Kenyan. Um, the early links with colonialism at the Institute of Education are clear. The Institute was initially founded in 1902 as the London Day Training College for Teachers. In 1927, the director accepted appointment to a body with clear links with a number of colonial projects, the British Advisory Committee on Native Education in Tropical Africa. As part of the work for this committee, he was invited by the Colonial Office to establish a course at the Institute of Education to prepare students for work as education officers in Africa and to support missionaries preparing to work in teacher training colleges in what was then uh, Tanganyika, now Tanzania. A colonial department was established in 1934 with a lecturer appointed to specialise in the comparative education of primitive peoples. The, thus institutionally, the teaching and research of the Institute 
were clearly bound in with the colonial education project. In the 1950s, there was a change of name when the colonial department became the Department of Education in tropical areas. Only in 1973 was some distance from colonialism signalled in a new name, the Department of Education in Developing Countries. In 1995, this became the Department of Education and International Development. So you can see that kind of genealogy. Um, and I guess uh, it reflects the implication of the field in those colonial legacies. Um, but I think that that field has gone up and down over the years in terms of its implications. So we should have a kind of analysis to think about the, political, the changing political economy of the academy. It seems to me that at the moment, this, our field, is very much tied to this imperial mission. And I think the reason is, is because of processes of privatization, increased dependency on external research funding, increased activity in consultancy, which ties academics to funding from major policy makers. And perhaps in certain periods, there was more of a critical debate. So Mamdani, in his talk a few years ago at the Development Studies Association, was reflecting on that and talking about the 1960s and 70s. Probably you studied some of the work there. Uh, dependency theory, uh, you know, that kind of work, early work of Fanon, and those kind of areas. It was a quite critical period in development studies when uh, the empire speak, spoke back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Mamdani reflects on that and he says, development studies used to be the critique of empire, but now it has become the language of empire. And I think that what he means there is that, like, um, my, uh, my school, Educational Social Work, is on the campus at the University of Sussex, and on that same campus is the Institute for Development Studies. And the Institute for Development Studies is, um, and together all of those constitute the number one in development studies in the world and the reason is is there's so many people that work on international development in Sussex and most of them work at IDS. IDS as an institution in the 70s was fully funded by the British government with a block grant and IDS had lots of academics that were producing dependency theory and critical thinking right now all of the staff of IDS have to earn their salary, three times their own salaries, by external consultancy, right? Ask them to say boo to a goose and they will never do it. They are silent. Silent now on the issue of Palestine, silent on, on, on issues of defunding, of aid and this kind of thing. Because once you're a consultant, you're only as good as your last consultancy. You don't want to upset your paymasters. So they're caught in this. I had an Italian friend who went for an interview at the Institute of Development Studies, and when he left, he said, Mario, that wasn't an interview. It was a financial inventory. <laughs> they just asked me how much money I'd brought in over the years. That was the only thing. They weren't interested in his intellectual project. Yeah? He didn't get the job, by the way. <laughs> um, so I guess that side is something for us to all think about, no? Because you're probably all already consultants, yeah? So you're already caught up in different ways in these things. And I'm not absorbing myself here, yeah? What I'm telling you is I'm telling myself as well about how do we get caught up in things that we didn't even realise we were caught up in. Uh, I'm trying to give you the benefit of my hindsight so that you are a bit more aware of how you could get caught in these things. Okay, so going from the diachronic, let's go to the synchronic. So the present, how do we get, how do we become implicated? So I talked already a little bit about um, the way that education got caught up in the war on terror and the post, um, uh, the post 9-11 invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. One of the things that probably all of you, when you relate to Afghanistan, you think about girls' education. Is that right? You can say no, I think about going to look for um, Osama bin Laden in the caves, and you know, there are other things. Yeah. I know there was a range of narratives. But particularly in the UK, 
the moral justification of intervention, at least when, since it started to go wrong, was we're working to get girls back into school. We're working on gender and education, right? So when I was doing this research, and Jeffrey Sachs, a famous uh, economist of development, uh, was doing some work on the spending of the US occupation. And he discovered that, uh, and I'll just read that because it's, it's just shocking to me every time I, I think about this. According to a recent report by the US Special Investiga Inspector General for Afghanistan, the US invested roughly 946 billion between 2001 and 2021, yet almost 1 trillion in outlays won the US few hearts and minds. And here is why. Of the 946 billion, fully 816 billion, or 86%, went to the military outlays for US troops. And the Afghan people saw little of the remaining 130 billion, with 83 billion going to the security forces, another 10 billion was spent on drug operations, while 15 billion was for US agencies operating in Afghanistan. That left a meager 21 billion in economic support funding. Yet even much of this spending left, left little, if any, for development on the ground, because the programs actually support counter-terrorism, bolster national economies, and assist in the development of effective, accessible, and independent legal systems. So, from that data, I tried to kind of extrapolate how much was spent on education, not education for girls, but just education generally, out of that whole outlay, it is 0.13%. Now, considering all the publicity, contrast that with the money, and then think about what was our role in the justification and legitimation of the occupation saying that it was about the girls, because it clearly wasn't about the girls. If it was about the girls, yeah. it would have spent a bit more than 1% of yeah. the funding, right? So there we start to think, if I was working in Afghanistan, would I be implicated in that? So I'll give you a personal story. Not easy for me to talk about, but I'll do it. Uh, in the middle of this conflict, one of my closest friends uh, was working for the International Rescue Committee. And she was working in a refugee camp, and we were working on a project together, and I called her, and she didn't make the meeting. And after about four hours, I thought, um, this is strange because she's really good uh, at returning calls. So I called again. Eventually, I called the IRC office in New York, and they started crying on the phone. The reason was that her and four others, Jackie Kirk is her name, you can Google it, um, and Jackie Kirk was pulled out of her car by the Taliban along with the driver and three other workers and they were all assassinated, right? Now, Jackie was a humanitarian worker, one of the founders of this field of education in emergencies, published quite a lot of stuff. Um, but two days after, the Canadian government, she was half British, half Canadian, put her on a roll call of fallen soldiers. So they saw her as a soldier, as part of the military mission of that field. She never saw herself as that. She saw herself as humanitarian, but she got caught up in that. The Taliban also said that they were all legitimate military targets. So both sides claimed us as participants in this military process. No? And but they agreed between them. They huh? actually agreed. They agreed. Yes. And by default, it made all of us that go and work in conflict de facto soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. And I wrote a piece after that called Are We All Soldiers Now? Uh, which tried to talk about that and tell the story of Jackie and, and the way that we get caught up in that. And that was uh, 2008. So it's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, that is an important one. Um, now, thinking about the different ways that our field is implicated, so you can see there we get caught up in the military mission. Um, this textbook, which if you haven't read the paper, is the one thing that normally people, wow, this is uh, something surprising. So this is a 
math textbook um, produced for refugee children in refugee camp in the borders of Pakistan. Um, the curriculum was written and funded by USAID, by the University of Nebraska uh, in, the 90, in 1984 to 94, 51 million was spent on producing and distributing over 13 million textbooks uh, to Afghan youth to return, in order to encourage them to return to fight against the Soviet occupiers at that time. Yeah? And so this is a quote from one of the books. Um, there is an uh, academic at the Institute of Education that did his PhD on all these textbooks, so you can get more quotes, but this one is just illustrative. The speed of a Kalashnikov bullet is 800 meters per second. If a Russian is at a distance of 3,200 meters from a Mujahad, and that Mujahad aims at the Russian's head, calculate how many seconds it will take for the bullet to strike the Russian in the forehead. Uh, this, uh, this is an arithmetic yeah. problem. Right? Now, look at that. Now switch your brain and ask yourself if this was a Hamas textbook and what you would do about it and what the West would do about it, and what the media would do about it. But when we do that, it's, it's, okay. it's just pragmatism, no? Yeah. It's just trying to help the children. <laughs> Second thing, post 9-11 also created <laughs> the situation where discursively we were being produced as soldiers. Yeah? Um, this was a moment where people were talking about joined up policy making. Um, and so the concept of um, the three D's in development became important. Linking diplomacy, defense, and development. And Canada, and the Netherlands, and Germany, and the UK, they all adopted this approach. And it led to kind of statements like this. Which this is from Co Colin Powell, who by the way, Colin Powell was one of the soft side, the doves of the Bush administration at that time. Uh, and he says, as, as I speak, just as surely as our diplomats and military, American NGOs are out there serving and sacrificing on the front lines of freedom. I am serious about making sure we have the best relationship with the NGOs who are such a force multiplier for us, such an impo important part of our combat team. We are all committed to the same single purpose to help every man and woman in the world who is in need, who is hungry, who is without hope to help every one of them fill a belly, get a roof over their heads, educate their children, have hope. Now, of course, we, we, we don't disagree with the, the last couple of lines. Yeah, We all want to be make people happy. But the question is, do you want to be known as a force multiplier? Do you want to be known as part of the combat team? Because, unfortunately, you go into battle without a tank, without protection, without a weapon, and see the spike at that time of the killing of aid workers like Jackie and others. Yeah? So there is real policy reasons why these things uh, started to uh, prevail. Um, so we could go on and talk about the different ways that education intersected that. From madrasas, and I talked earlier about that, to the use of gender and education, to this ongoing kind of binary Christianity, uh, secular, uh, Islam, uh, highly religious and problematic and a lot of tensions that have spread well beyond the global south to every part of the uh, world. Um, but also the use of education as part of the military mission. Um, and, uh, you know, this really emerged in both Iraq and later in Afghanistan when the US and the Allied forces, including the UK, realized that bombing from above was insufficient to win the conflict. So, you know, initially, after the invasion of Iraq, um, George Bush went on the ship outside uh, uh, and on, the, on the Gulf and said, you know, we declare victory. But very quickly, the, the, the US realized that the Iraqi army had melted away, but it came back as a guerrilla army and it was fighting the US uh, in guerrilla warfare. And this led to the US to change military strategy from this heavy bombardment 
to counterinsurgency strategy. And counterinsurgency strategy requires you not only to kill the bad guys, but win the hearts and minds of the communities. And one of the ways of winning the hearts and minds of the communities is to uh, build schools or build hospitals. Uh, so funding of education and funding was started to be carried out by the military. So the UK military and the US military started to build schools in different parts of the world. Um, and so education got caught up in a range of ways. So thinking about this, and then thinking about this field that some of you are in, some of you maybe enter, is to think through how did we get here, yeah? And what's the implications of that? And what can we do about that? So, I mean, for me, um, so in the last three years, I've been working on a project with 20 early career researchers from Africa and 20 early career researchers from Central Asia. And the logic of the project, basically, was there's too many white people like me in the field of education and emergencies and we needed more diversity so we've worked with young researchers to try and we don't say that because of the pigment no but because of the brain and the mentality yeah? so it's about trying to think about bringing diversity into the field and thinking differently in that and that's part of the solution it's not the only solution yeah you can't just change the chairs in a room and think things are going to change you've got to do other things but that's part of that um, other things is to start to kind of think about um, how we talk in the field of education and emergencies in, in a bit more of a joined up way, right? So I'll give the case of Camilla's work on psychosocial responsibility because you had that yesterday, right? So you know it well. So for Camilla, the focus is on a particular relationship, a particular practice. And all of the other things which she mentions during her talk, so she mentions that basically now everything has gone back to zero in Gaza. So she's been working for 15 years in Gaza and now they're back to zero. Actually, they're, they're worse than zero because yes. there are more people that are traumatized yes. now than ever was before. Mm. Um, but for the practitioner, they will say, we can't engage in any of those other things because they're out of our brackets yeah and you can understand that yeah so let's focus in on the children and try to change that and try to help them to recover in the difficulties of that right but what we should be saying is that the same people that are funding your program are funding the weapons that are landing on gaza the same people are doing those things so let's try to connect these things up a bit and try to engage. Now, to be fair, I think there is some of that going on at the moment. And in fact, Jan Egerland, who is the director of the Norwegian Refugee Agency, is one of the few people that has very clearly spoken out in the last few days about the situation in Gaza. So, so there is the kind of, um, in a sense, there, are, there is a, a healthy discussion. Ritesh Shah, have you heard that name before, Ritesh Shah? Camilla mentioned him yesterday, right? He copied me into a letter today that he'd written to the INEE telling them that he was really upset with their new global strategy, that it didn't confront the things that it said it would confront several years ago during the Black Lives Matter, that it hadn't addressed its links with colonialism, with white supremacy, all of these things. They just became a footnote in the steering and the business has gone back to usual yeah and he Ritesh is right inside a consultant he works for lots of agencies yeah so there are lots of people now that are tired of the silences the avoidance of major issues and also feeling that they're implicit and that goes beyond the INE field right there is currently and this has been in the news a letter, I think, of 200 civil servants from Germany, from UK, from US, who are worried about their complicity in genocide because of the actions of their governments at the current moment. Yeah? Uh, so there are real debates going on in many parts of different sectors who normally would instinctively be silent. 
Um, so there is a lot of discussion. So now uh, just to kind of um, finish off with kind of linking that a bit to the Gaza issue. Um, I think for me that what's going on in Gaza is a kind of reflection of the collapse of the US empire. It's the kind of, we're in the death throes. If you go into the death throes of any imperial period, it's normally a time of great brutality. Yeah, um, Gramsci, which I have on the next, yeah. uh, on the next slide, talks about um, the crisis consists, he was writing in the 1930s at the time of the rise of fascism in Italy, and he says, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear.